Hey everybody, welcome to Scott Plus Plus. Today we're gonna to try something a little different. We're gonna to go to Reddit and look at startup ideas. I'll comment on which of them I think have potential, what the biggest technical challenges might be, and what I would focus on to validate a minimum viable product. Uh, this is the first time I'm doing something like this, so it's probably rubbish, but that's an opportunity for you to leave a comment, let me know how I can do it better. All right, let's hit it right after the intro. All right, so I'm just here on Reddit slash startup ideas. We're gonna go through the top post of this last month and we'll see how many we can get through. All right, this one, travel app. Let's see, app allowing travelers to immediately buy tickets at forecasted minimum prices. All right, this idea is effectively an app that is attempting to predict the price of a airline ticket in the future. The idea being that the ticket may be $100 now, but we know from historical factors or whatnot, fancy algorithm magic, that uh, maybe in a month before you're flying, it's going to be down at 80, right? So you could we give you the opportunity to buy it now at 80. Then once it hits that price, we would actually buy it and then you would have your ticket. This sounds like some some risky business, right? Because if the price doesn't go to where you thought it would be, if I was thinking about building this app, I would maybe pivot slightly. Effectively, what you could build, which would be relatively easy, is a app that automatically attempts to buy a ticket if it's within a certain threshold, right? And the user could theoretically set rules that if it drops below this price, go ahead and buy it. Because effectively, all you're doing is saving the user having to come back again and again and try to predict uh, what the price is going to be. Uh, if you are, are already storing that data and you can show the historical data of what we think the price might be over time, I think that is uh, very useful. And then theoretically for a business model, I would consider whether it makes sense to do this on a uh, as a commission on the ticket sale, or maybe this is just a subscription, right? to a service that you buy uh, for people who are traveling often. Uh, and if you can show them uh, the historical data of the of the ticket prices and tell them when the best time to buy might be, that's good information, even if they don't necessarily end up buying the ticket through you. Um, and so some sort of app that just automates that process of kind of watching the ticket, buying at a good time. Uh, and then of course I have to ask, does this just apply to airline tickets, right? Are there other things you could build if you're building a tool that lets me set a price threshold, like set a window and say, keep trying to like scrape this site and buy this thing if it hits uh, within this price. I can see that being extremely useful. And I think people would pay for that. Like if it's saving the money, right? In the long run, then of course I would pay for that. For a minimum viable product, I would wonder if airline tickets are the best route. There are a lot of complications with airline tickets. There are a lot of companies already in that space uh, and it is so heavily regulated, right? To buy a ticket for someone, you need all their information, right? So is there another commodity that requires less information from the user to set up this kind of like automated price watching service? Uh, theoretically, if we wanna make it even more minimal, right? Uh, we can set up first the scraping and then we can just have us throw an alarm or send an email to someone and say, hey, now's the time to buy this thing. Here's the link that you sent me to buy it. Uh, and then they go in and do that. So again, when, when reducing this to an MVP, just kind of trying to pull out the scope, get to the essence of the product, which is like saving the user from having to check again and again and again uh, to get the best price, as well as showing them in advance some data and analytics of what the price looks like historically. I think both of those are really valuable, but finding the exact market to plug into uh, and kind of get the most value for the least amount of work uh, is something that would be an interesting problem to solve. So really good idea. I think the poster JAE cube uh, number three <laughs> uh, can, continue to, can continue to iterate and refine this idea. I think there's something very uh, certainly valuable there to a user 
and not too difficult to implement if you reduce enough of the scope. Then once you have that and can find product market fit, you can then continue to evolve uh, what all the app is able to do to go from sending an email alert to actually making the purchase. Obviously each, each commodity or each thing you're actually trying to purchase is probably gonna be more horizontal development, right? So building, building an app that can buy an airline ticket is very different than building an app that can buy a pizza, right? Those are different kind of APIs you would have to plug into and deals that you would have to make. But the core of it, of watching these prices historically and setting alerts is something that can be generic and can be easily scaled. So finding that right thing to hit first uh, to validate the idea is going to be key. So best of luck with that. All right, let's see what this is. Let's see, building a startup is overwhelming. We made a new platform that makes the startup journey simple and easy. Uh, sync currents. That's all you'll ever need to start your business. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Okay, I've gone through the site and I'm still not entirely sure <laughs> what they're suggesting here. After reading uh, all the comments and thankfully they've been active to reply to the comments. Most of the comments along the lines of this is vague. What are you actually talking about? Uh, it seems like they're wanting to build an accelerator, something like Y Combinator or 500 startups, uh, but online uh, and easier to access. I certainly see that need and the value that it could provide, though I'm skeptical uh, if they're not able to actually get the networking, the same networking opportunities that you would have at an accelerator, especially with investors. You know, if it becomes just a newsletter of like best practices for starting a business, I don't know that that's particularly useful. If they can build that community uh, and make that a little more accessible, that would be awesome. I think for something like this, you definitely want to take an iterative approach uh, and I've seen this and some other things recently, but the idea of cohorts, right? So instead of like, here's a site and we're going to launch it live. Uh, if your idea is really to mimic kind of an accelerator, get a batch of people together, right? And if the things you're offering are networking opportunities, abilities to learn from each other, some coaching, right? And that's something I didn't see specifically mentioned here, a newsletter and best practices for startups in general is not the same as coaching. But anyway, see if you can do that with a small group. Uh, and if you can do that successfully uh, in through your online platform, right? And then if you can do that successfully, grow, do another group, learn from your mistakes, get a bigger cohort, etc. Now that said, I don't know specifically what makes this different than any of the others that are out there, Y Combinator, 500 startups, etc but I don't mind having more competition in that space. What I would really like to see is democratization of the investment opportunities, right? Right now you kind of have more and more startups uh, competing for the same capital. Uh, and the amount of work required to kind of vet a potential startup to decide whether or not that's a decent investment opportunity is huge. If there is a way to do that so that people with less capital are able to invest and kind of pool their resources. That would be interesting. I'm not entirely sure if this is offering that. All right, moving on. Host coworkers. One sentence. Thank you. A co-working space out of someone's house or apartment. So effectively, this is Airbnb, but for co-working. So basically you offer your home, uh, not for someone to come and spend the night, but for someone to come and work for the day. I'm a little skeptical, uh, generally working spaces, you know, I don't know so many homes that have like extra office spaces around. What I would try to do is if I were building this uh, MVP is focus on just running a co-working place from someone's home, right? So take away the whole idea of complete rando signing up to host people, find a few specific homes uh, of people who are maybe interested in do this, build the whole site just for uh, letting people sign up to come and work 
out of those specific homes, right? So everything can be very carefully crafted. You curate the experience and you reduce an entire half of the problem to worry about. Um, and then if you can do that successfully, then you can look to expanding. Uh, probably you wanna look in places where real estate is expensive and thus people don't have uh, the space to have a nice office set up at home, probably San Francisco, New York, et cetera. And if you can find some key homes in those cities where the people who live there uh, are maybe going to the office anyway on some days. So it's kind of like a timeshare business. I know for me, per like at my company, we're going to the office 50% of the time. So there are some days, not that I have a home, but, <laughs> but if I did, I maybe wouldn't be using it uh, for half of the week, but I would for the other half. So maybe on the days where I'm gone, I can offer that space to somebody who needs it, right? So that is inefficiency in the market that can be corrected for. So if you can find those people who are interested in trying this out uh, and then build the site specifically to rent out their like home offices as spaces, uh, see if you can get traction with just that uh, and then go from there. All right, family organizer app, calendar and reminder for activities. Keep track of an invite list, record weekly or monthly videos of each child to make a collage. That seems like scope creep. Leave video messages for kids. Tracking location. Oh, this seems like a lot that's kind of all over the place. Ability to track children's location. I want to stay as far away from that as possible. <laughs> Leave messages for your kids. I can maybe see that as useful, maybe as an Alexa skill or something for a smart home rather than anything else, right? If I'm gonna leave a message of like for when they get home from school or something, have it automatically play, I think that could be something useful. Uh, and you know, once you know it's confined to the home, you have a little more uh, security there. Recording videos of your kids to make a collage it kind of has nothing to do with organizing. Like that could be an app all by itself. And then the crux of it is this calendar stuff. Obviously, like if you have kids that you're driving around, they're notorious for having so many activities and whatnot, there's probably room for a more powerful calendar tool, uh, something that lets you sync different calendars together, maybe set uh, rules of how to color coordinate things or what types of reminders to set to kind of uh, automate that a little bit more. What I would what I would love to see someone take on is maybe try to build the best calendar app possible. So something that is able to pull in data from multiple different calendars, right? Because probably each of the children's school has a public calendar where they post things same as other types of activities. Um, and then if you can set up, and eventually if uh, the AI can help do this, uh, different types of filtering and rules. Uh, for example, you know your kid uh, is in band, and so you wanna be sure to grab from the school calendar anything that mentions band, right? And you can ignore anything else or put it less uh, in lower priority. And then maybe it throws alerts when it notices uh, conflicts, right? It's like the classic situation where you need to get this kid to ban and that kid to soccer practice at the same time. Maybe it would show you an alert a couple days before that this is going to be challenging. Maybe it lets you uh, pin different people to the, to the different events. Uh, so you know if uh, you or your partner is gonna be responsible for driving the kids to that activity and see how far you can get with that, right? Should be relatively simple and kind of fun to work on. And then if you can find uh, users who find value from that, then maybe continue to, to extend it, right? So again, cut down to the core of the idea. In this case, it seems to be the calendar. Uh, see what value you can provide, what is missing from existing calendar solutions that are already out there. Just build that. And if that works well, then you can think about expanding. Uh, and obviously the less sensitive data you need to collect from people, the better. Uh, so ideally, if this is something that just operates on existing data 
in other people's calendars that they can import, uh, that's better. Okay, kind of on a theme here, AI powered travel planner. Let's click the link on product, huh? Nice. Personality driven itinerary planner. Interesting. Uh, let's watch the video. Let's be real here. Planning great travel experiences takes time, and who has the energy to design the perfect trip every single time they travel? That's why we created Barrel, to help you design awesome travel plans on autopilot. Here's how it works. On our website, fill out your traveler's preferences. This tells us who you are and exactly what you like and dislike. Then tell us where you're going, and Barrel auto-selects recommendations based on your interests. Then hit complete, We'll send it to your phone and enjoy your newly personalized trip. <laughs> okay, so that's interesting. Honestly, I would use this not even as a travel app, right? Like I'm constantly in the need for finding uh, new things to do, places to eat right where I live, right? I don't need to go to a whole nother city to do that. If I am going to travel kind of exotically, I'm looking for things that give me an authentic experience in that place. So it's a different mindset than, you know, restaurant recommendations and, and whatnot. And route optimize makes me, <laughs> makes me stressed out already. Uh, but I can certainly see the need for that. I think really it's gonna come down to how well it can do this, right? So like what exists today already are thousands of lists of like 10 top things to do in New York City or whatnot. And so some of these things are kind of static and apply to anybody and don't take the person's preferences into consideration. Uh, if I were building an MVP, I would first find friends, giving them my you know personality test and then seeing if I can manually plan good trips for them. Uh, and if the data exists or what data is missing to kind of map those personality traits or preferences to a good trip. So after I've confirmed that I can do that uh, for people manually, I'm almost thinking remove the travel aspect, right? Uh, because someone mentioned in the comment below, like the more data we have about a specific person, their, their preferences, what they like and don't like, the better recommendations we can offer them. Uh, so why limit it to when people are traveling? If I just had a uh, a social planner, uh, AIML, to be recommending new events, new restaurants, things like that, right where I live. I think that would be great. And you then open yourself up to a longer period of time to work with the person as they're uh, confirming or rejecting your recommendations. You learn more about them. You're able to offer them better recommendations until you find that fit. So I would maybe remove the travel aspect, focus just on recommending events and restaurants based on their personality uh, and refine your algorithm to get to know people better, to build up your library of uh, events and restaurants to pull from and the data you know about those places uh, and go with that. So it's definitely a cool idea and I wish them the best of luck with that. That's something I would actually use. Okay, they just keep rolling. Help DIY influencer offer paid consulting advice services to their followers. Okay, so this is interesting. So basically, if you have someone who is, uh, like they have a YouTube channel and they do DIY crafts or something, create a platform to kind of get in touch with that person. I can see this going in two different directions. One is if you need specific advice for your own project, being able to quickly connect with an expert in that field and get advice over an app, I think is amazing. I know things like this for exist. I saw an ad recently for an app where you can have a video call with the plumber, for example, and they can walk you through doing something. I think that is fantastic. Uh, the other direction is the influencer side of things. I know there was an app that lets you like buy birthday greetings from celebrities or something to that effect. And so some sort of service that helps influencers or celebrities connect with fans 
I think is, is definitely something worth exploring. There's probably a lot out there already. So I see this kind of in two different directions, right? And so I don't think that the intersection of influencer plus expert is, I don't think that's like a synergistic approach. I think you're losing out when you put those two together. I would separate either focus on setting up a video chat with an expert to help you walk through uh, some advice or problem you're having or connecting specifically with influencers and helping them manage their followers. You know, of the two of those, I would probably lean more towards the uh, hooking up with experts thing. You know, pick an industry. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if it's plumbing or whatever. Uh, and then again, similar to my advice with the, the co-working thing, is if you can eliminate half of the work to get an MVP going, right? So remove, for example, you know, forget about letting experts sign up for the platform and having to validate that they are experts, etc. Just find five people that you know are experts in this and are somewhat available. Create the site that lets people book time with them and maybe it doesn't even let them choose which of these experts it's going to. It just connects them to whoever you have available. See if that generates enough business uh, and then go from there. So definitely more stuff I wanna see uh, moving forward is the ability for people to just get on a call with experts, whether they be electricians, uh, plumbers, dragon slayers, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. I think that's a very cool uh, idea and something I'm excited to see more of in the future. Tender for sponsorships. Most companies hold events that need sponsorships like award ceremonies, etc. Is there a marketplace for sponsorships? You know, I kind of like this. Theoretically, a business that is doing sponsorships uh, has a fixed budget that they're using for these types of things and making it easier for them to see what all is available uh, and quickly decide what they do want to sponsor, whether it be like a Little League team or whatnot, uh, rather than relying on connections and like first come first serve, right? Maybe that's useful. I'm not in a position to, you know, I don't really know that world of, of sponsorships and whatnot to, to have a lot of advice on the business front. For if I were building an MVP, obviously you're more likely to have events or people that need sponsorship than people who have money to become sponsors. So you probably want to focus on the other side, right? You don't just want to build another GoFundMe, right? So instead focus on the other side. Here are the businesses that have said, hey, we have this much money and we're going to do sponsorships and we want to do it in our local community, right? So a platform that makes that information more readily available and then gives the opportunity for people who match the criteria to kind of apply to be sponsored. And so then you're kind of solving a problem for these businesses of how do we efficiently uh, decide who to sponsor. So probably the hardest thing is going to be finding the, the companies that have money <laughs> looking to give it away and to sponsor somebody. Um, so first I would try to find them, talk to them about their process of how they go about selecting these people and then see if you can build something that makes it easier for them and more efficient to do that, right? So then you know you're providing value and then go from there. All right, let's do maybe one more because I'm getting hungry. Feedback for a SaaS product idea. All right, my first feedback is have a more specific title. Startup idea, building a platform for selling digital or physical products. So eBay, Etsy, Stripe, uh, what are we talking about? So I'm not exactly sure what this idea is. Obviously there are a lot of services out there that let you set up an online store, right? It's the whole industry of e-commerce. Specifically what they're proposing here is that there would only be a commission on every product instead of a monthly fee. So how are you going to build something of equal quality to what already exists, but do it cheaper? This is one of the big problems of capitalism is the economies of scale, right? So once you are big, you can do things uh, more efficiently than new companies that are trying to spring up, right? That's where we get monopolies, which is a problem. <laughs> if I had to take this on, instead of just saying, let's do the same thing that other people are doing and find a way to do it 
cheaper. I would try to find some some new feature, new way of doing things, etc. So I don't know if that's through a better UX, through more specific scope, trying to approach the problem in a different way, but just doing the same thing that's already done, but find out how to do it cheaper. Uh, I don't think that's going to fly. So in this case, you know, I would start by picking a product or type of service you want to focus on and then seeing what specific friction the, the shop owners in that space are facing. Uh, and it can't just be the cost, right? Um, because that's not really where you have the leverage. So find something else you can do to make that experience easier for them or for their customers to remove some friction. Uh, so you can try to get some headway there. Okay. I might've said last one before, but this one, uh, looks interesting. Spotify for code snippets. I don't know if that was a good metaphor, but they talk about, uh, being able to browse and find a little bit of code that you can then effectively buy. Uh, or you have like a monthly subscription fee and the, whoever wrote the code gets a cut. There is obviously a huge issue in the industry that you either have open source uh, or you have closed source and there's not a great way for people to write kind of like utility code or whatever and get a profit from that unless you're going the full size of like building a SaaS. Unfortunately, right now, I think the best thing we have is like the tip jar. <laughs> you know, this is a really hard problem to solve. If I'm grabbing just a small bit of code, obviously if it's on uh, Stack Overflow or something, I can just copy paste it. Also, it's not usually worth it for me to take in a new dependency or something like that, set up a new connection. It might be easier for me to just write that code. And then my system has less coupling, less dependencies. But now that I think about it, his metaphor is interesting because if you think about the music industry and how people were originally buying albums and then came theoretically like Napster and file sharing and then everyone could just pirate their music and get it for free. But now we've seen with the advent of like Spotify that people are again paying for that service, even though that same music is theoretically still available through uh, torrents or, or whatnot. And so if there is a a UX that makes paying for things and doing things kind of like morally and legally, both frictionless and seeming at the correct price point, then people, people will pay for that. So maybe this hard problem for people to be able to make some kind of profit from contributing to open source, maybe it is just a UX issue. Um, and if we can solve that, uh, then some of these developers can start getting uh, honestly, the, the payment they deserve for the, what they have contributed. That's something to think about. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers today. All right. That was a new thing we tried. We looked through some Reddit ideas. Let me know, uh, if you like, let me know if you like this video, I guess, uh, should I do this again? Or is it best to die as a one-time experiment? Uh, either way, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.